This hearing is a call to order. Um, the goals of achieving energy independence and reducing our global warming pollution cannot be adequately addressed without a transformation of our transportation sector. More than any other, this sector lies at the very nexus of these twin problems which are facing our nation. Two-thirds of the oil which we consume every day currently goes into the transportation sector. It is a simple fact that during the years after Congress mandated a doubling of fuel economy standards from 13.5 to 27.5 miles per gallon, it dramatically reduced our oil dependence. During that period, our oil imports dropped from 46.5 percent in 1977 to 27 percent in 1985. But since then, our fuel economy standards have been stuck in neutral or even in reverse, and our dependence on foreign oil has skyrocketed to roughly 60 percent. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles hold the potential to radically transform our use of oil. While the transportation sector is powered mostly by oil, the nationwide electricity grid runs on very little, only 3 percent, according to the Energy Information Administration. Increasing the use of plug-in hybrids can help to make driving much less petroleum intensive by using electricity. Such a transformation could have an incredible effect. According to the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, replacing our passenger vehicle fleet with plug-in hybrids could reduce our oil consumption by 6.5 million barrels per day and our global warming pollution by 27 percent. Moreover, turning our vehicle fleet into plug-in hybrids would not require a significant expansion of our electrical infrastructure because plug-in hybrids would primarily be charged at night during off-peak hours. That same study found that 73 percent of our existing passenger fleet could be powered using the existing electrical generation infrastructure. Now, some automakers have produced plug-in hybrid prototypes and are beginning to announce long-term plans to manufacture them. We need to ensure that these promises not only become reality, but they are surpassed. We cannot afford to wait five years or more to begin seriously looking to unlock the potential of this technology. It is already possible to convert the roughly one million hybrid vehicles that will be on the road this year into plug-in vehicles capable of getting 150 miles per gallon. This conversion would allow existing hybrids to begin traveling between 20 and 60 miles on a single charge. These next generation vehicles would allow Americans to go from zero to 60 miles on barely a drop of oil. Consumers are clamoring for a revolution in automotive technology. Innovations such as the plug-in hybrid should not have been sitting on the shelf for so long. After all, this isn't rocket science, it is auto mechanics. We have to make sure that we pay attention to all of these new technologies that have the potential to reduce our oil dependence and emissions of heat-trapping gases and listen to the American people all across the country who are calling for them. We have the technology. We have the innovation. The only thing that has been missing is the will. And now I would like to turn and recognize uh, the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, since the Select Committee's inception in April, I have repeatedly stressed four principles that I and many Republicans believe must be part of any policy addressing global warming. First, I have said that any policy must produce tangible improvements to the environment. I also believe that any policy must protect the economy and include participation of all the major industrialized countries, including China and India. Lastly, global warming policy must support and advance technological progress because technology, not taxes or regulation, provide us with the best options to reduce U.S. dependency on foreign oil and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Between established technology like nuclear power and fantastical solutions like fertilizing carbon dioxide eating plankton, the range of technology possibilities to address oil dependency and greenhouse gas emissions are fascinating. 
Researchers are also reaching to find breakthrough technologies and to improve existing ideas. And what better technology to win a race than a car? Hybrid car technology is already in the marketplace and competing with the traditional gasoline-powered car. Recent news reports show that some hybrid cars have reached speeds of over 100 miles an hour. Could this mean that the hum of the hybrid may replace the roar of the engine at the racetrack? Plug-in hybrid cars hold even greater promise of reducing our reliance on foreign oil and our greenhouse gas emissions. Early indications suggest that if this technology were fully employed, it could reduce oil consumption by 6.5 million barrels a day and our greenhouse gas emissions by 27 percent, which is very promising indeed. So will plug-in hybrid car technology be the winner of this race to free us from foreign oil and greenhouse gases? The answer is, is, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else does either. And it shouldn't be up to me or any of my colleagues in Congress to decide. Ultimately, it should be consumers who decide when they choose which products they will buy. After all, with gas prices what they are, I doubt it will take a congressional mandate to sell a car that gets 150 miles to the gallon. Despite its promise, plug-in hybrid technology is expensive, and it's still unclear if it's effective on a mass scale. To be sure, it appears that this technology is still a breakthrough or two away from being parked in everyone's driveway. Maybe we'll see breakthroughs in hybrid technology, or perhaps there is another technology that will move us beyond gasoline, such as biodiesel, hydrogen fuel cells, or liquefied coal. Already we're seeing the private sector take an interest in private or plug-in hybrid technology. Last month, Internet giant Google announced it would partner with A123 Systems to help fund research that could produce a much-needed breakthrough in battery durability. I am pleased that A123 Systems President and CEO David Vio is here to inform us about the research into this technology. On Monday, Ford Motors and Southern California Edison announced a joint initiative on plug-in hybrid research. That's also good news. But while Ford Motors CEO Alan Mulally said that plug-in hybrids could probably be in showrooms in five to ten years, he made no firm predictions or promises. Like any smart business, Ford Motors is waiting to see if technology develops before making a significant financial commitment. And we all know the U.S. domestic auto industry is not awash in cash these days. <coughs> Congress should heed this example and be careful in its commitments especially when it comes to funding research. Sure, there's promise in plug-in hybrid technology, and I'm glad to see that the private sector is willing to fund R&D. But I caution my colleagues against believing technological breakthroughs are merely a res as a result of money and funding. For nearly four decades, Congress has devoted billions to nuclear fusion research, hoping for a breakthrough in energy production. So far, we are still waiting for commercial results. We can't afford to wait four decades for a breakthrough that will release us from our dependency on foreign oil. We now know that hybrids are fast, but the question is, will they be fast enough to win this technological race? I hope today's hearing will help us begin to answer this question. I thank the chairman for the time and yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you. Over the break, I experienced the yin and yang of global warming. I want to share this with the committee. Uh, the yin was I went hiking Saturday up in um, the Cascades in Washington State and saw mile after mile of dead and dying fir trees killed by the budworm that can ravage our forests because it doesn't get cold enough to kill them anymore. Sunday, the next day, I went to Everett, Washington and saw the rollout of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner an incredible piece of technology that reduces CO2 pollution 20 percent per passenger mile, one-fifth less CO2 emissions because of the use of technology. Yesterday, I talked to a guy named Dave Moore who works at Vulcan, Inc. in Seattle. He's one of the first to have a Prius uh, plug-in uh, that uses an A123 battery system. He got it in Boulder, had it uh, converted in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, drove it back. The first 100 miles, he got 80 miles a gallon. He does better now. He plugs it in at work, and I chided him because he's stealing electricity from Paul Allen, uh, but he says it's only 15 cents a day. 
so it's not much of a hit. So he commutes 30 miles each way to work and spends 15 cents a day for the energy to run his car and his daily commute. And the, the number that got me in his description of his plug-in Prius is that it has been, he finally, since he got the car several months ago, he has driven 1,200 miles before he had to put a gallon of gasoline in it. And I think uh, a promise to Americans that you can drive to work 30 miles a day spend 15 cents on your fuel and go 1,200 miles before you spend a dollar to Saudi Arabia is a pretty good deal. And it is not future rocket science. It is here today. Plug-in hybrids are the technological cavalry. They have arrived just in time, and we've got to make sure they get implemented. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, Michigan, Ms. Miller. I will save my uh, time for the questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. I waive, Mr. Chairman, and I will submit my opening statement. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, look forward to uh, reading through the testimony. Unfortunately, I have got some conflicts this morning. I am going to have to leave a bit early. But uh, I am proud to announce I think I am probably the newest Prius owner on the panel. Uh, my big old Chrysler died last uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago back here, and I went out and bought a, a Prius, which I had been wanting to do for some time, uh, because I wanted to get better gas mileage, and uh, certainly it reduces emissions as well. I am intrigued by the notion of plug-in hybrids. Um, as we know, they aren't readily available on the market yet, um, but I think they hold great promise. I know that uh, if you recharge the hybrid and run it off the electricity more than the gasoline, you emit one-fourth the amount of carbon into the atmosphere. If the uh, electricity production comes from uh, gas-fired uh, uh, energy, I mean, you still got to have electric energy produced somewhere. So there are other trade-offs, certainly, in the environment. In the Northwest, we are fortunate because we have a huge hydro grid. So if you want to talk about the absolute lowest carbon footprint emission other than, well, probably maybe one of the lowest, if not the, uh, it is from hydropower. And so in our part of the world, you plug, if you can plug them in, you are getting renewable energy right off the start into a car, and I think that will go a long way. I do think there needs to be uh, greater development on the, the batteries themselves, and hopefully a domestic battery industry could emerge as well as opposed to relying on those made in China or Japan or, or somewhere else so that we truly can become more energy independent um, here in, in America. So I am intrigued by all of this. I intend to take the, uh, the testimony with me and apologize for having to leave early today, but I, I look forward to America moving forward. The final comment I would make is in Central Oregon there is a company that has been on the forefront of hydrogen fuel cell technology, and I know they are working with some automakers to use a hydrogen fuel cell to power some of the electrical needs of a car which, as we know with all of our gadgets, is rather significant now and is today powered through gasoline, uh, producing the electric energy that is used in the car. So there are some interesting innovations that can come about in the years ahead that will help move us off our dependence on oil, and that is a good thing. And so thank you for the hearing, and I thank our witnesses for being here today. I thank the gentleman. I, I actually I drive a, a Toyota Camry hybrid. It only gets 40 miles a gallon. I know the, the Prius does a lot better, but it, it, uh, it's a you really uh, should upgrade to a more fuel efficient model. <laughs> it does make you I, feel virtuous, though, yeah. doesn't it? Um, the, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm uh, delighted that you're having this hearing today. You know, I often complain about the hardships that my district faces in Los Angeles, in particularly East Los Angeles, one of the uh, harder hit areas that has various environmental impacts, one being smog, congestion on the road. But one thing I have to say about the State of California is that we have done, I think, above and beyond by really extending tax credits for people who can purchase hybrids. In fact, our carpool lanes are made more accessible to those people who do purchase those vehicles. And I am really proud to say that today we have heard mention from the other side of the aisle about the innovations that are coming forward from places such as obscure uh, districts like mine in the city of Rosemead, in the 32nd District, where Southern Cal Edison is embarking on this partnership 
uh, with the Ford uh, auto, automotive industry. And I think it's, it's wonderful that those creations are occurring uh, back home in Southern California. We need to continue to promote that. And as a strong advocate to see that uh, we do as much as we can and bring about change uh, at the local level, the grassroots level, because I really believe that uh, our young people and our children, when we see them at our local schools, often ask about uh, what are we doing about changing uh, climate change and what are we doing to help improve the environment and what kind of future am I going to have? And I think we all have a responsibility to act uh, responsible and to make good decisions. So I applaud the witnesses for being here today and, and thank the chairman for the opportunity uh, for us to hear the witnesses. Thank you. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm glad to join in this love fest. Uh, I want to thank you and compliment you uh, for holding this hearing today on plug-in hybrid vehicle technology and its potential to reduce our reliance on oil and particularly on imported oil. Um, I believe it is one of those great opportunities for bipartisan cooperation. Uh, clearly, it is incumbent upon all of us in America and especially upon policymakers to pursue uh, alternatives to oil and alternatives to imported oil, uh, and plug-in hybrid technology holds great potential. Uh, in my state of Arizona, we face air pollution problems and we face long commutes and the possibility of being able to do those with hybrid vehicles that run on uh, electricity and do not uh, uh, further pollute uh, or cause additional greenhouse gases is a great potential. Uh, I certainly agree that there are tremendous possibilities for hybrid vehicles uh, and in addition to the gain we can achieve from them in terms of uh, issues of environment and issues of global warming, uh, there is also the issue of uh, strate strategic concerns. And I have heard, I want to compliment all of our witnesses for being here and thank them, but in particular I want to note that I have heard Mr. Gaffney say on a number of occasions that oil should be a normal commodity and not a strategic one. And uh, I am greatly concerned about our excessive reliance on imported oil from nations who are uh, often not our friends and who are uh, hostile to us. Uh, I look forward to hearing from the uh, witnesses today in our testimony, but I, like my colleague Mr. Walden, have a conflict, and so I will have to leave for at least part of the hearing. Uh, but I do want to compliment you. I would note that in the Energy Policy Act uh, last year, I inserted language to encourage uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Energy to ramp up its development of battery technology. I think it is well known that we lag behind the Japanese in battery technology, and that is one of the reasons we are not as far ahead in uh, hybrids and uh, plug-in hybrids as we might be. Fortunately, that language remained in the bill and is now law, and we are doing more aggressive things. I hope we can do even more. Uh, this is certainly a step in the right direction. We need to pursue every alternative uh, energy source we can. And again, I compliment the chairman on the hearing. I thank the uh, gentleman, and I thank him for his participation on leadership on this issue. Um, the chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from um, Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the uh, hearing. I will waive an opening uh, statement in favor of uh, questions at a later time. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, will forego my opening statement, but with your indulgence, would just like to point out that I drive flex fuel vehicles and look forward to the day when I can drive a plug-in flex fuel hybrid and look forward to Mr. Gaffney's testimony. Thank you. Great. Uh, Chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for the hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for taking the, opportun the opportunity to come and talk with us on this issue. As you have heard, we are all interested in what we do to achieve energy independence and how we best go about making energy independence an attainable, realistic goal for our country, and we appreciate your participation in the discussion uh, today. I'm looking forward to what we're going to hear about the plug-in hybrids and their being a part of the solution as we move forward. Now, where I come from, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee, we have a lot of auto manufacturing. And there is so much creativity and so much innovation that is going on in this industry. And we want to be certain that we encourage that. Mr. Shattuck just talked about provisions he had in the energy bill we had passed uh, two years ago now. And then we are also working on an additional bill that is going through our committee, just finished our Energy and Commerce Committee. 
and we're looking at how we spur that innovation. I do have some concerns. Uh, one is the cost. Uh, hybrids are about $3,000 more than a conventional car, and then a plug-in hybrid is about $6,000 more. And as you're talking with consumers, that becomes an obstacle. So that is something that I'm concerned about. Then you look at the battery, and the battery is only going to last a six to eight year period of time. Then you have the disposal problem with the battery. So those are all obstacles. They're problems that need to be solved as we move forward on the issue. Um, as also, as we view this, I want to be certain that we don't pick winners and losers on energy technology. There should be choices through a free market for our consumers. And right now, Americans are choosing not to buy hybrids. And it's only 2 percent of our new car sales. And so all those sums, such as the Toyota Prius, are selling well, others are not. And in the future, they may uh, choose to buy hybrids, but we need to be certain that that is done by incentives in the market, and not uh, mandates from the government. Um, we need to know that this is going to be a part of our discussion, a part of our solution, uh, plug-in hybrids, and we appreciate, again, your work, Mr. Chairman, the staff's work and your work, we appreciate, and I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all, our witnesses today. Uh, in its brief history, this committee has addressed many of the critical topics related to our dependence on foreign oil and the impacts of global warming, but the subject of today's hearing may be the most important yet. The overwhelming majority of our dependence on foreign oil is directly tied to the cars we drive. There is simply no way to be serious about lessening the influence of OPEC, reducing prices at the pump for working families, or cutting down on the tailpipe emissions that are, choke, are choking our air and warming our planet without making our cars more efficient. Uh, I and my wife uh, drive American-made vehicles. I decided to vote with my dollars for an American-made hybrid. I could have. Uh, had 20 miles per gallon more by buying a Japanese hybrid, but I wanted to show that at least uh, if they build it, some of us will come. And, uh, uh, and I believe, actually, that uh, uh, it is essential that we compete as a country and that our industry compete for the efficiency market, because uh, that is a big part of why uh, U.S. auto manufacturers are losing market share. Um, when one compares American hybrids uh, and the average mileage available on an American car with that available in a Japanese or another uh, foreign-made car. Uh, I have also noticed that uh, uh, there are currently systems available for my, my car which would take it from 30-some miles per gallon to 60-some miles per gallon as a retrofit, and for the Prius, which would take it from 50-some to over 100 uh, in the third market, aftermarket, uh, uh, third party. Um, market, uh, the systems and, that are being built by small companies that inherently have to cost more money to the consumer because they are not dealing with the scale and the quantity of hundreds of thousands of vehicles that the original manufacturers could crank out. So uh, the sooner that we uh, hopefully uh, all get on board uh, and use the ingenuity that we have been hearing about and the creativity and the techn technological prowess this country is famous for. Uh, the better. The challenge for this Congress is how to push plug-ins over the final hurdle and help them to cross from being a novelty to being the norm. And uh, this means pioneering companies like those represented today uh, will grow to create economies of, sc economies of scale, help to spur wholesale investment in Detroit in this technology, and make plug-ins an everyday option. And I yield back and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired and all time for opening statements by members of the select committee has expired. We will now turn to hear from our witnesses. Um, and I would like to begin by recognizing our first witness, uh, David View, who is the President and CEO of A123 Systems. His company is a leader in the plug-in hybrid business, uh, fitting existing hybrids with the batteries and equipment needed to convert into plug-in hybrids. Mr. View brings more than 30 years of experience in high technology and component businesses. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. View. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. 
You have to push the uh, button there, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, um, Congressman Inslee, and Congressman uh, Sensenbrenner, and, and the rest of the uh, committee for being here today and for the, the fine work that you're doing to reduce our dependency on foreign oil and, and to uh, reduce the carbon emissions that so um, plague the climate that we live in today. Um, it's a great opportunity for A123 to be here and to tell our story a little bit, and so I very much appreciate that as well. Um, outside this building today, we have a couple of demonstration vehicles that um, uh, implement uh, some of the technology that you've uh, spoken so eloquently about. Um, these vehicles will, and particularly the uh, Toyota Prius vehicle that we have a demonstration of with our plug-in hybrid technology, um, demonstrates um, fuel mileage according to uh, national testing in excess of 100 miles per gallon. And uh, for commuters that uh, drive less than 40 miles per day, um, urban driving testing would indicate between 100 and 150 miles per gallon. Um, the benefits of this uh, to us is, uh, on a vehicle-by-vehicle -vehicle basis, um, a reduction in, in fuel consumption for the average American of over 80 percent and a reduction in the carbon emissions of over 60 percent on a national basis, inclusive of the uh, emissions associated with the uh, uh, production of the electricity that is used to, plug, to create the uh, energy for the vehicle. Um, this capability is made possible by what I would say are the convergence of three events over the last five years, uh, the first of which is the widespread availability of production hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, and that was certainly stimulated to a great degree by the work that was done here to create in tax incentives and to increase awareness of those, of those capabilities. The second thing was the development of advanced lithium-ion battery technologies at A123 Systems in Watertown, Massachusetts, and the third of which was the creation of a, a very elegant and, I think, uh, novel system to employ these in a retrofit manner to allow us to uh, immediately begin to take advantage of these capabilities. And that would be in a module, which we call a, a battery range extension module, that can be applied to the vehicle to increase the energy capacity so that the car can depend more on electricity and less on um, polluting uh, gasoline. Um, the, the car is called a plug-in hybrid vehicle, and um, I think everyone here is quite familiar with them, but the, the, the nature of the vehicle is that um, it provides additional electrification to a hybrid vehicle, and it can be plugged in to charge the batteries from a standard household circuit. A123 system started five years ago in uh, Watertown, Massachusetts with some technology we licensed from MIT and uh, five people and a $100,000 Department of Energy SBIR grant. Uh, today, we have raised more than $100 million of private equity from a combination of venture capital sources and major corporations. Our backers include, from corporate standpoint, General Electric, uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, Motorola Corporation, Qualcomm, Alliance Bernstein, and a host of the top uh, venture capital companies in America. We have over 380 employees today uh, around the world, uh, including our facilities in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we do research and uh, defense-related uh, battery technology development, and our facility in Watertown, and a facility in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we initially took our um, a technology uh, to a commercial partner, Black & Decker, to work with them to create uh, an advanced uh, cordless power tool set, um, first of all, to help them advance the state of the art in that space with more powerful batteries, and second of which, to demonstrate the capability of this new technology on a commercial scale. Uh, this has been made, cap made possible by this uh, nanophosphate material, which we uh, licensed from MIT and commercialized in our labs. Uh, it brings to um, the market a combination of greater power, um, better safety, improved safety, and much longer life, both calendar life and cycle life, in combination of which had never been available previously. As a result of this, we have been selected by General Motors to be a partner in the development of their batteries and battery systems for the next generation plug-in hybrid vehicles, which we expect to see in the market in the next three to five years. Um, we have partnered with BAE Systems to create uh, battery capability to help them with the electrification of uh, commercial buses, city buses. Uh, in particular to work on the program for the uh, Daimler Chrysler Orion 7 bus system, which is used in, uh, in one of the major places in New York City. The, impl the, the, the implementation of our battery uh, capability in those systems saves over 3,400 pounds per bus 
and significant increase in the fuel mileage or the benefits of the electrification of the vehicle as a result of it and more than doubles the life of the systems. Uh, we have also partnered with General Electric Corporation on the development of a first uh, generation fuel cell hybrid uh, bus technology. Um, and we are participating in a number of uh, other commercial programs with domestic and international auto companies. I say all of this because I want you to understand the seriousness that we, uh, we take in our business and to understand that the primary nature of the business at A123 is to create battery systems that can be implemented by the OEMs themselves and through the major uh, manufacturers of uh, not only automobiles but trucks and buses. But we have a message today which I hope is the one key message I can leave with you is that we believe that in all the legislation that you have pending in front of you here today uh, in Congress, nothing uh, is greater than this plug-in hybrid vehicle module conversion and bring forward the opportunity to get a savings of 80 percent reduction in fuel usage on a uh, consumer basis and a 60 percent reduction in emissions with little or no change in the infrastructure we have, and it can be done in the immediate future. I think it is a very strong statement, and that is why we as a company have been supporting the activity of creating an aftermarket opportunity, building modules that can be put in vehicles not five years from now, but tomorrow. These vehicles, um, and there is certainly some criticism at times about aftermarket activity and some concerns about the viability of it. I will uh, say to you that we are very serious about making sure that these vehicles have been uh, NHTSA tested for safety and crash readiness and EPA certified for emissions to uh, provide the increases that we have and improvements that we have um, so testified to. These systems can if be you, installed if, in less than If you could summarize. I am sorry. So in summary, I want to thank you for this opportunity here. Um, the cost of the systems is a, a bit significant today. We look forward to your support with tax credits, and we thank you for the um, opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. View, very much. And you will have plenty of opportunity during the question and answer period. <clears throat> Our next witness, Rob Lowe, has earned uh, an Emmy nomination, two Golden Globe nominations for his work on the West Wing. He joins us uh, after most recently transitioning from White House Communications Director on West Wing to California Senator and Republican presidential candidate in the new show, Brothers and Sisters. He believes that America is ready for a great leap as well. Mr. Lowe is a nationally recognized environmentalist. Uh, we thank you for uh, coming to testify today. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Inslee, Sensen Brenner, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to prepare to appear today before this distinguished panel. And although I have been a senior advisor to the President and am currently a Republican junior senator from California running for President, I am honored to sit before you today because you are the genuine article. And when it comes to doing the nation's business, we all know that you have the ability to be the real stars. So thank you. Like many Americans, I have watched with increased frustration as our country drifts under the status quo without any concrete national policy for energy independence. With the issue of global warming entering the cultural zeitgeist, it seemed like that might break the deadlock, but so far it appears to have not. And now in a war on terror in which our oil addiction helps fund our enemies and we ask our best and brightest to serve and sometimes to die, at least in part, to protect our oil needs, surely we here stateside can and must use this critical moment in time to at last begin implementing a responsible and practical plan for energy independence. And a large segment of the public already knows this. I believe American consumers are patriotic and they're smart, and they want to do their fair share. They've heard of the potential of these electronic cars, fuel cells, and the dreams of hydrogen, but today and even in the near future, they can't go out and actually buy any of these dreams. And that's why I've come here today. I would like to suggest that with your help and the help of your colleagues, we may in fact be able to pave the way to use existing breakthrough technology to bring far more efficient green cars to the American public right now. New American technology exists today that can transform most conventional hybrids getting 40 to 50 miles per gallon into plug-in hybrids getting 100 to 150 miles per gallon, can go 40 miles on a single four-hour charge, cost 60 cents, you plug into a standard electrical outlet, and it can save the average consumer over $1,000 a year and fleet users up to $3,500 a year in gas costs 
while saving 100 tons of CO2 emissions over the life of the car. I recently heard about A323 systems and their batteries, which are powerful, smaller, safer, and longer lasting than anything else on the market. They fit in the spare tire well. They can increase the onboard electrical storage by many multiples and cutting gasoline consumption by 80 percent, emissions by 60. Now, I'm not a Mensa member, but I play smart guys on TV, so I wanted to know more. And I found out that the technology has been chosen by GM. I've read the independent assessment done by the Department of Energy's premier Argonne lab in Chicago last summer, which resulted in 150 to 250 miles per gallon in urban driving. And then I checked with some friends who have the cars themselves, and they confirmed these results. Now, I found this to be amazing. And with this education, I came here today to ask you, why not exercise your leadership right now to put in place a wartime-like mobilization plan to find out if this new technology can cut our oil consumption by 80 percent, starting right now? Certainly, Congress should be able to provide the same kind of early user tax credits for these plug-in modules that were so critical in bringing down the prices and jump-starting the current growth in demand for standard hybrids. And obviously, game-changing advances are sometimes met with indifference or even resistance from the establishment. But that said, can't our amazing and powerful Detroit automotive industry be given a message that together with effective incentives to, to speed up their conversion to plug-in hybrids by using this or any other technological advance? You know, in the West Wing, someone asked my character, Sam Seaborn, why he wasn't practicing law at a big law firm, making a lot of money, and instead was grinding it out in a life of public policy. And he answered with this story. In 1940, our armed forces weren't among the 12 most powerful in the world. But obviously, we were going to fight a big war. And Roosevelt said the United States would produce 50,000 planes in four years. And everybody said it was a joke. And it turns out it was, because we produced 100,000 planes. We gave the Air Force an armada that would block out the sun. That's the spirit we need here. So in the end, the choice before the nation and congressional leadership is simple, waiting years for any viable mass-marketed plug-in under the status quo, or a major push now to jumpstart the conversion of plug-ins from the growing millions of hybrids coming to our roads. With what's at stake in the world today, it's not much to ask. We've done far more in the pursuit of far less. And yet, when inspired, our government is capable of amazing achievement. As I once said on the West Wing, over the past half century, we've split the atom. We've spliced the gene, and we've roamed tranquility base. We've reached for the stars, and never have they been closer to being in our grasp. New science, new technology is making the difference between life and death, and we need a national commitment equal to this unparalleled moment of possibility. If that was fiction, we're here today to deal with reality, but the stars are aligned, the time is now, and patriotic and smart Americans await this Congress's successful efforts. I thank you for your time and for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, thank you, Mr. Lowe very much. Uh, next um, witness is um, Frank Gaffney. He is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy and a leading thinker on the national security implications of our energy dependence. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for Nuclear Forces and Arms Control Policy and Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy under President Reagan. Mr. Gaffney, uh, welcome. And uh, whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on what uh, I guess it's Senator Lowe <laughs> said about um, the national security implications of the plug-in hybrid option. Um, about two years ago, almost to the day, I had a chance to testify before this body's Armed Services Committee about what was then pending as a significant public policy problem, which was Communist China's attempt to buy a major American oil company, Unical. And I testified, and it's reprinted here at length, and if my full testimony would be part of the record, Mr. Chairman, I'd be grateful. But the, the key point of it was I believe that China has appreciated 
a lesson that I'm not sure we have internalized as well as we should, which is that energy insecurity can translate into tremendous national security problems. Indeed, I think it was a catalyst for World War II when the imperial Japanese feared that they were not going to have access to the energy needs that they believed they needed because of growing competition or perhaps the determination by the West to deny them access to them in the, in the, uh, in the Western Pacific. I said at the time that unless the se sorts of steps that uh, I and others of uh, my colleagues who have joined an organization called the Set America Free Coalition, unless such steps are adopted, it would appear as a practical matter we will inevitably find ourselves on a collision course with communist China, particularly if worldwide demand for oil approaches anything like the projected 60 percent growth over the next two decades. In my testimony, I go on to enumerate a, a variety of other potential national security threats arising from our energy insecurity. Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, something on the order of three quarters of the world's oil, proven oil reserves are in the hands of adherents to an ideology I think is best described as Islamofascism. We and our allies are, as Mr. Lowe mentioned, as a result transferring enormous wealth in the form of payments for imported petroleum to people who are trying to kill us. Not least our putative friend, a so-called moderate regime in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, is using such funds to promote a pincer movement against the West involving Wahhabi recruitment and indoctrination via Saudi-funded mosques, madrasas, political influence operations, prison and military chaplains programs and campus organizations on the one hand, and Muslim Brotherhood front organizations on the other. Our enabling of such behavior is the height of folly, an irresponsible and certainly unsustainable practice from a national security perspective. Moreover, various oil, suppliers of oil over the years have recognized that the threat of supply constrictions can translate into a weapon against the United States and other oil-consuming nations. In my testimony, I go on to enumerate half a dozen of them. Um, we have not seen another oil embargo of the kind of 1973-74 uh, fame, but that is not because any of the governments capable of trying to mount such an embargo have eschewed it as an immoral act or as something they would be opposed to in principle. It's simply that it doesn't serve their interests at the moment. That could change at any time, especially as the world becomes more dependent upon OPEC oil. Terrorists appear to understand as well the dependency of our economy on imported oil and the ease with which interruptions of the supply can be affected through attacks not here, but on the infrastructure elsewhere. In fact, had the Abqaiq processing facility in Saudi Arabia not narrowly avoided a devastating attack, we would be even now in the midst of a full-blown energy crisis as a result of that facility being offline for some time. What is to be done? I mentioned the Set America Free Coalition. Uh, one of its chairman, Gal Luft, is here. Um, I thank him for his work, among other things, in the field of educating people about the plug-in hybrid option. But also, if I may just mention the importance of diversifying our energy uses, in particular in the transportation sector, in other ways as well. Uh, in the Set America Free Blueprint, we talk about ethanol, not just from corn, but from other sources. Methanol, not just from coal, but from other sources as well. All of which can be part of an alternative fuel approach, fuel choice, if you will, 
if enabled by flexible fuel vehicles, uh, one of your colleagues spoke of driving today. There are about five million of them on the road. I cannot for the life of me understand why we allow any cars sold in America today to be other than flexible fuel vehicle vehicles. It costs about $100 to make them when you are doing them en masse. And with very few exceptions, every one of them would benefit from this. And you instantaneously create the opportunity for diversifying the fuel that powers our transportation sector. Let me turn just very quickly in closing to the matter at hand. There are others on the panel who are more capable of talking about the technology. I would simply suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, that the kinds of steps that you and your colleagues are now taking that constitute a veritable tsunami behind the idea of bringing to market, not in 10 to 15 years, but today, a technology that may not be perfect today, but could rapidly begin to address the problem that we are facing, the insecurity that arises from our dependency, particularly in our transportation sector, from the consumption of inordinate amounts very inefficiently of oil, most of which comes from people who are trying to kill us. I began with a threat from China. Let me close with one. It is my understanding that may, we may well see coming to Walmarts near you the Cherry, a vehicle Communist China proposes to sell for something I am told perhaps as little as $7,000, maybe $10,000, perhaps for as little as $12,000 to $13,000, thanks to their dominant position, with all due respect, in the battery technology business you may be able to see American consumers offered vehicles that could get, with a flexible fuel vehicle feature perhaps, 500 miles per gallon of gasoline from a Cherry that is a flexible fuel and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. I dare say that will be the end of Detroit if that vehicle is available in large numbers in America in the near future, and it could be. I share my colleagues' view that we mustn't let that happen from either a national security or an economic point of view. I call on you to redouble the efforts you are making to try to ensure that it is not. Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, Mr. Gaffney, very much. Uh, our final uh, witness, uh, Fred Hoover, has graciously agreed to join us on very short notice after Mayor Will Wynn of Austin was left stranded. Uh, at the Austin uh, airport last night because of um, severe thunderstorms. Uh, Mr. Hoover represents the city of Austin, which has risen to a position of national leadership on energy and climate issues. The Austin Climate Protection Plan will eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from virtually all municipal activities by the year 2020, while dramatically enhancing the use of renewable power at Austin Energy, a utility which it works closely with in developing its plan for a plug-in hybrid fleet. Mr. Hoover, we welcome you. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you about the potential impact of plug-in hybrid vehicles on both the nation's energy usage and global warming. Uh, the City of Austin has an, has an exceptional asset in its municipal utility, Austin Energy. Its Green Choice Program has led the nation in renewable energy sales for the past five years. Its energy efficiency and green building programs for commercial and residential buildings are national models. Austin Energy also is the first electric utility outside of California to join the California Climate Action Registry. Earlier this year, the Austin City Council adopted a climate protection plan that sets goals and strategies to make Austin the leading U.S. city in the campaign to fight global warming. Plug-in hybrids are part of that future. The city's interest in plug-in hybrid vehicles took hold as they realized the potential environmental and economic benefits that come with electrifying the transportation system. These are reducing foreign oil with domestic resources for energy independence, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles, powering vehicles with renewable energy, reducing air pollution in urban areas, and lowering fuel costs for consumers. The benefits that could be realized from plug-in hybrids aren't some futuristic idea, as you have heard 
earlier today. The vehicle technology and the electric infrastructure to fuel these vehicles are here today. In January 2006, the City of Austin launched its Plug-in Partners national campaign to persuade automakers to build plug-in hybrids by demonstrating that a market for these vehicles exists today. Austin Energy has taken the lead in forming this national grassroots coalition, which now counts nearly 600 partners, including 23 of the nation's largest cities. Our city partners include Los Angeles, New York City, Chicago, Boston, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, San Francisco, Kansas City, Missouri, Milwaukee, Phoenix, and Memphis. This coalition spreads over 41 states and includes state and local governments, electric utilities, environmental and national security groups, the, and the business community, including the largest auto retailer who joined because their CEO believes they can sell plug-in hybrid vehicles. The automakers have taken notice. GM has announced plans for two plug-in vehicles, the Saturn View and the Chevy Volt. Toyota and Nissan have both announced that they are working on plug-in hybrids. And earlier this week, as was mentioned uh, earlier in the hearing, Ford announced an intention to sell plug-in hybrids in the next five to ten years. Plug-in hybrids have the ability to enhance energy independence in the near term at virtually no cost. Our national power system could charge tens of millions of plug-in vehicles without requiring new power plants. Consumer demand for electricity peaks during the day, but more than 40 percent of the capacity of generators in the United States sits idle or operates at reduced load overnight. It is during these off-peak hours that most plug-in vehicles would be charged. The Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Lab reported that the nation's existing electric generation capacity would be able to fuel 84 percent of the U.S. cars, pickups, and SUVs as plug-in hybrids without a single new power plant being built. Earlier this year, the Brookings Institution announced that nothing could do more to reduce oil dependence more quickly than making cars that could connect to the electric grid. Electric utilities could become the gas stations of the future. With the infrastructure already in place and the significant unused generating capacity to recharge cars overnight, the only thing plug-in hybrid vehicle owners would need is an extension cord. Plug-in hybrids offer the most promising approach to reducing carbon emissions in transportation. A California Air Resources Board study of emissions along the entire supply chain found that using today's national electric grid, a battery-powered electric vehicle generates only 40 percent of the greenhouse gases produced by an equivalent gasoline vehicle. This would also shift the emissions that impact the public health from urban areas out to power plants where they are more easily controlled. As the nation's grid becomes greener, so would the transportation sector. Austin Energy produces a lot of wind-generated energy, mostly at night, which provides a perfect fit for environmentally friendly plug-ins. The green choice customers of Austin Energy would be fueling their plug-ins with wind from West Texas instead of oil from the Middle East. The environmental benefits of hybrids will be substantially increased as you enact Federal policies encouraging the greening of the energy grid. As U.S. energy prices that currently run about $3 a gallon for gasoline and the national cost of electricity at 8.5 cents a kilowatt, a plug-in hybrid uh, runs on the equivalent of 75 cents per gallon of gasoline. And given that half the cars in U.S. roads are driven 30 miles a day or less, a plug-in with even a 20-mile pure electric range could reduce petroleum fuel consumption by 60 percent. Uh, in summing up, Austin Energy is willing to put its money in support of this effort. It has committed $1 million in rebates to customers who purchase plug-in hybrids when they become available. The consumer tax credits for plug-in vehicles offered by Congressman Doggett of Austin and the House Renewable Energy Bill, coupled with these rebates, will help put plug-ins on the road and start us to the road to energy independence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoover. And we thank each of you for uh, your uh, opening statements. And we will now turn to uh, questions from the uh, committee uh, members. Uh, and the Chair will recognize himself for uh, an opening round of questions. Let me begin. Let me ask you, Mr. Lowe. You are one of the very few people who have ever driven a, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, and I think people are wondering, what is it like? And is it much different than driving a regular car? 
Well, you, what I the most marked thing that I found is you get almost competitive with yourself to see exactly how much amazing gas mileage you can be. You watch this sort of readout and you realize, okay, I'm going to come off of this stoplight a little slower because I'm going to get literally 100, you know, and two, sorry, 225 miles per gallon. So I find it actually makes you a more economical driver just by driving a more economical car. Um, that said, you can't imagine the attention that you get from people because the one that I've been driving says 150 miles per gallon on the side. So people come up to you and stop you on the street and want to know where can I buy it. I mean, the field, my non-scientific field testing tells me that there's a huge interest in this car. Uh, well, and so people want to know, Mr. View, um, Mr. Gaffney, um, is this a commercially viable idea or is this just some, you know, dream that uh, that people have. Can this happen? Can we actually produce vehicles like this that the American people can purchase? Oh, there's absolutely no question that we can do it. Um, we, we've made uh, dozens of demonstration vehicles to show that the technology can be implemented and we're going into our third generation design, which will be even yet more efficient than the current designs. We have a couple of steps between now and a, and a broad scale release of the product. One of them is NHTSA testing and EPA testing. We know that there are engineering activities associated with that, but these are problems that have been solved in numerous ways. I can tell you that we have, uh, as an as a, uh, industry, figured out ways to package gasoline, and it is much more volatile than what we have in our battery systems. So there is some work to be done, there will be no question about it. Uh, the big issue for us is finding ways to, to um, assure that the volumes will be there. We can build the capability to do it, and the volumes will drive costs down. Now, do you agree, uh, Mr. Gaffney, with Mr. Lowe, that um, that the volumes will be needed because the public will move to technologies like this and that, uh, that it will become a commercially viable business. I am not sure that I have the expertise to address that, uh, Mr. Chairman, other than to say um, I don't know of anybody who wouldn't rather get 150 miles a gallon than 17, 20, even 30. I, I, I don't, there may be people who prefer to uh, expend the money that is associated with it, especially as the price keeps going up, but I can't imagine it. But may I just address your question about is this going to be the future? Uh, no less an authority than Lee Iacocca has said this is the future of the industry. I am told that I think it is CalCars, which has been doing conversions of some of these Priuses and so on, um, started by discovering one of their engineers found a switch in his Toyota Prius that was inoperative. And when he re reverse engineered it, figured out that it was for a plug-in hybrid feature that simply had not been built into the car, this particular model. The reason I mention that is, I, I don't know if that's an apocryphal story or true or if it's Calcars, but, but the point is Toyota has clearly stolen a march on Detroit with the Prius and perhaps with your Camry. Um, but what is most important, it seems to me, is if their principal reason for not introducing as quickly as they can a plug-in feature is that it didn't jive with their marketing plan, which, as you know, has been built around the, the, the motif that you don't have to plug it in as a way of distinguishing the plug-in, the, excuse me, the hybrid they are making now from the General, Ele General Motors uh, electric car, which some people were frustrated about, did not have sufficient mileage. We should not be hung up on the basis of some, particularly a foreign manufacturer's marketing campaign. And I believe that it, this is a wake-up call for Detroit. If indeed there will be a Detroit in the future, it should be based on the idea that they need to get in front of these kinds of technologies using American uh, know-how and wherewithal wherever possible. Okay. And, uh, uh, and you, Mr. Hoover, you're, you're, Austin is committed to making this a commercially viable option for the residents of Austin. Right. When, uh, when Roger Duncan from Austin Energy uh, first uh, started coming to Washington to talk about this idea in two th late 2004, 2005, the response of the automakers were that, well, this was something that was kind of far in the future, over the horizon, the technology wasn't there because of the batteries. And in that time frame, we have seen, because of the support shown um, 
here on Capitol Hill and, and around uh, the other uh, groups in Washington, D.C., that the automakers have, have steadily accelerated that timetable as to when these cars have become available. And now you have GM and Ford both discussing these cars as being real uh, production vehicles that they will see in, in the near-term future. Great. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenberg. Uh, excuse me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I think all of us are sold on the concept that a plug-in hybrid is really the car of the future. Where we have the disconnect, in my opinion, is the fact that battery technology is not keeping up with our hopes. So I have a few questions of you, Mr. Volk, since you seem to know the most about battery technology of everybody in the room. Uh, where are your batteries manufactured? Uh, China. Okay. Uh, is there not an American battery of comparable capability available? Well, I'm going to qualify the first uh, comment, excuse me, that I just made. The, the actual cells, such as like I have in my hand, uh, we're having them produced in China, and we have um, multiple factories that are involved in that process. The systems themselves that you'd see in this car that's out here, which is a combination of batteries with uh, a lot of other gear and packaging and so forth, is made in America. Mm -hmm. So uh, about half of what you see overall is American content, and about half of it is Chinese. Uh, there, there are no... Um, uh, significant commercial North American um, lithium-ion battery manufacturing facilities today. And why would that be? Um, the, the commercialization of lithium-ion technology uh, was initiated by uh, Sony Corporation in Japan in 1991, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the Japanese put a uh, significant investment in the development of lithium-ion technology at a time when our major battery companies turned in a different direction. And um, I believe by the time that our companies came back, uh, they felt it was a bit of game over. Uh, our approach to this has been coming outside the box with new chemistries and to reinvent the battery technology, and we've been able to change the game substantially. I will say it isn't, um, it isn't out of any personal desire to go build uh, batteries anyplace outside of the U.S. Well, we made a decision that was somewhat defensive to the company's security which is to make sure that we took advantage of the lowest cost available materials and resources in the shortest possible period of time to secure a position of global competitiveness for our company. Over the future and over time, we have the resources today and the availability to make choices that will allow us to include North American manufacturing in our plans of the future. Well, if I were in, in your position, Mr. Vol, I would have made the same decision. So I'm, I'm not critical of this. but. Uh, the concern that I think we have as policymakers is aren't we exchanging a dependence upon foreign sources of energy from the Middle East, a lot of the folks there don't like us, for foreign sources of energy being made in China with the, <coughs> excuse me, lithium ion batteries? And what do you think Congress can do <coughs> to be able to jumpstart the North American capability of manufacturing? those components that you currently have to go to China to get? I think there's, there's, there's three pieces of this puzzle uh, in order to make sure that we are successful in this initiative today as a country. One of them is the early term incentives to create awareness and drive demand, increase volume. The second is to um, spend more money as, as, a, as a nation in the investment and research to drive cost and improve efficiency of the lithium ion systems that we have employed today. And the third one is the creation of a, um, an independent pilot scale and uh, small, at least small, capable manufacturing scale to demonstrate American manufacturing competencies. And I believe that it would make a great deal of sense for um, us as a people to invest initially in those factories to get that up and running. Um, uh, I agree with what you say. Now, uh, I have been a veteran of the Science Committee for most of my 29 years in Congress. And early on, I did an awful lot of overview of the non-nuclear energy research that the Department of Energy uh, sponsors, and a lot of that includes battery research. Uh, can you give me your opinion of whether that research has actually helped American manufacturing in this capability or whether it's gone in the wrong place? We have uh, uh, drawn on the resources of research activity around the country. Our, our people do that on a daily basis. Um, the, the competency that we have at a fundamental research uh, capability in America, I believe, is second to none. 
where we have failed in the battery industry is in the commercialization and execution. So that uh, investment that has been made has, has provided some dividends. We, the technology that we are employing today is considered by the industry to be the leading technology for plug-in hybrid vehicles of the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could I just add one quick point on that? I, I think you are absolutely right to be concerned about the industrial capabilities of this country in this technology. From a national security perspective, as well as from an economic perspective, it is the height of folly for us to be depending on China or, for that matter, Japan or Korea, which are, I think, the other principal uh, foci of these kinds of technologies at the moment. This is a place where we really need for both the Defense Department's applications. I have served on a Defense Science Board panel looking into this, and I think there is keen interest in this whole question, and, and it really needs your support. Thank you. Great. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. First, I want to tell you how happy you're, you are here. Uh, Mr. Lowe eloquently used a metaphor involving our response to World War II, and I have suggested a, another metaphor, which is our Apollo project. And virtually everything you have all suggested is contained in the new Apollo Energy Act I have introduced with, with some of my colleagues. I am glad you are telling your story, too. It is a very important one. I have tried to tell it, Mr. Gaffney, Mr. Hoover, Mr. View. All of your stories are in a book coming out called Apollo's Fire. I have tried to tell your stories because they are good ones. And the more that people know them, the more they will embrace both these technologies and the policies it needs to drive them. And I really believe we are in a, a technological race as we were in the original space race right now with the rest of the world to develop the technologies manufactured some here, maybe some overseas, but to keep these technologies homegrown. And I think that is the race we are in right now. Um, I, I want to express frustration that this is not moving faster. I met a guy while writing this book called Felix Kramer with a group called CALF Cars in California. They developed the first one of these to get them on the road to try to get Detroit and others to promote this. And I am still frustrated, frankly, that they are still talking five to ten years to get these mass produced. The Dreamliner that Alan Mulally built at Boeing took, I don't know, maybe six or seven years from conception to roll out. These things are on the road today. The batteries are manufactured today, and we are still talking five or ten years for mass production. What would you suggest is the most important thing we can do to, to accelerate that, that rate of getting them on the road? I, anyone could help me on that. Well, um, two suggestions. One that's already been discussed, uh, targeted funding for research on the batteries to help make sure that the commercialization happens sooner. And then secondly, uh, incentives uh, for consumers to buy um, plug-in hybrids. As, as I mentioned, Austin Energy is willing to put its money up for uh, those types of incentives. But I think the federal incentive that was done originally for hybrids was a big uh, part of that. I formerly served in the Maryland State Government. We had a, a state uh, incentive to encourage people to buy hybrids back when they first came to the market, and it had a lot to do with, with pushing that. So I think those types of things can be done immediately. Uh, you will be pleased to know I think both of those are going to be in our bill and that we have a tax incentive for, for consumers to, as with an increasing amount per megawatt hour of, of capacity. We also I passed an amendment uh, with the help of others last week to develop an R&D program to, to develop the software we need to use these batteries as part of the utility grid, because now we have this tremendous ability to use batteries as a storage capacity for the utility grid. We had an earlier uh, testimony from another committee member who said it might have an economic value of $3,000 for owners to essentially rent their battery to the utility to store the utility electricity in their grid while you are asleep at garage. That is a good way to make some money. We hope that will happen. Uh, I wanted to focus and, and ask, uh, ask you all about uh, the ability. I think, Mr. Hoover, you made reference to the fact that even on today's grid, which is mostly coal powered, mostly dirty CO2 emitting coal powered grid, even on today's dirty grid, we get CO2 savings relative to gasoline and other situations. And my perception is as that grid becomes cleaner, as we move to, to more renewable resources, including perhaps clean coal someday, I believe this technology can get cleaner over time. In other words, the car you, have in, you buy today is actually going to get cleaner over time because you are going to be using cleaner electricity. Is that a fair uh, assessment? 
I would agree with that. I mean, our view has been, um, to put it in a simple way, it's much easier to control emissions from the generation side than from the tailpipe side. And uh, previously what we've tried to do with automobiles is to deal with what comes out of the tailpipe and, and do things to that. If you change the mixture that the car runs on so that it's running on a cleaner fuel, uh, you're lowering emissions and you're pushing the the uh, uh, control of the emissions to one central place as opposed to I thousands of tailpipes. Thank you. Quick question, Mr. Review, as far as costs. Um, costs are high now relative. We are in a small manufacturing situation. They are obviously going to come down when we have these huge scales of economy. Can you make any projections about costs once we get to mass scale production for these vehicles relative to hybrid costs today? And also as far as operating costs, I have heard, I've heard numbers as low as one to two cents per mile, whereas gasoline is at least $0.09 cents a mile to run your car. Could you address those, both those issues? Certainly, yeah. Uh, with respect to the uh, initial cost today, we are projecting a uh, sale price for a, a converted, a conver a multi-year multi -year warranted uh, conversion of an uh, existing hybrid next year in less than $10,000. Um, we expect that that will go down by about 40 percent over a three to five year period by increasing volumes gradually over that time and by improvements in the technology that we um, have in our product pipeline. Uh, as far as the operating cost is, is concerned on the vehicle, we are expecting an, um, an 80 percent reduction in the consumption of gasoline and the associated cost. Now, the, uh, one of the questions is the cost of the electricity that is used at night. Uh, in some areas of the country and the world, uh, smart metering is being implemented to take advantage of the lower cost of electricity in the evening uh, or as opposed to the daytime cost. And so um, in some areas where it is uh, 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour uh, in the day, the cost is now being um, provided for evening use of electricity in the 2 to 3 cent per kilowatt hour range, which is the combination of which would make these systems even more cost effective. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the uh, gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think this uh, entire hearing is fascinating. Certainly the subject matter is something I have a great de degree of interest in coming from Detroit and uh, uh, outside of Detroit, I should say. But uh, really, uh, Michigan uh, actually during World War II was known as the arsenal of democracy because we had the manufacturing capability uh, that literally built the armaments that led the world to peace. And yet now, uh, the Congress seems to be making a conscious decision to bankrupt Detroit. And I appreciate the fact that, um, particularly Mr. Gaffney, uh, my principal committee assignment is sitting on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, and, I, and I wanted that committee assignment because I believe that the first and foremost responsibility of the Federal Government is to provide for the national defense and to protect the homeland. And yet, <clears throat> When we think about what the Congress is trying to do to uh, achieve uh, energy independence, uh, energy security, which does equal national security, I absolutely do believe that, we have put Detroit uh, in a bind because we expect them, we expect the domestic auto industry to compete internationally with countries like building automobiles, with countries like Japan which uh, you mentioned about Sony uh, making their investment. Actually, the Japanese government has spent over $1.5 billion on lithium-ion battery technology and doing the R&D. China, the government of China is doing the same kinds of things. Uh, Health care costs uh, that uh, the foreign uh, automobile uh, industry does not have to pay, yet our industry obviously does have to pay. GM has over 1 million retirees right now that we are paying health care costs on. And we want to be an active participant in getting to where we need to be as a country. Yet we are so focused on the antiquated modeling system of CAFE, which is crazy. It is nuts. That was actually initiated in the 70s to get us off of consumption of foreign fuel. Uh, since that time, our consumption of foreign fuel has increased by 100 percent. Now, I am not a mathematician, but it seems like that is not working. Wouldn't it be better for us as a Federal government to assist the domestic auto industry on R&D with lithium-ion battery technology and all of these kinds of things. Because if we do not do so, we are literally going to put the domestic auto industry out of business under the CAFE standards that just passed the, the um, Senate. Chrysler will go bankrupt. 
because of their product mix, about 70 percent of the product line is SUVs and uh, light trucks, et cetera. So we are going to bankrupt the domestic auto industry. How does that, I guess this is my question, how does that advance our national security interest and our energy independence interest to bankrupt the domestic auto industry, thereby only allowing our consumers the availability of buying foreign cars? I would like to make at least the first comment on this. It is just that uh, um, we need the domestic auto manufacturing uh, um, capability uh, now and in the future. And I, I believe that uh, the cooperation of American technology uh, that is being developed today by us and by others, by the way, there are a number of other companies working in the same field as aggressively as we are at this point in time, the combination of which can be very competitive on a global scale today. And I think that without that union of the two and without that available, our business is not going to be successful in the long term. Our opportunity is in the cooperation with General Motor Ford and uh, Donald Chrysler. Yet, uh, uh, just, uh, I would just because uh, I would like to hear your answers, uh, Ford loses $3,200 on every Ford Focus that it sells, and they are selling these cars just to uh, comply with these crazy CAFE standards. We will never be able to compete under this model. I am very sensitive to the concerns you have expressed, particularly, as I said earlier in response to Congressman Sensenbrenner, the industrial base of this country is a national security imperative. Um, I think in a previous appearance before the, your committee, I testified that one of the things that I think we have done a woefully inadequate job is understanding how dependent we are becoming on foreign suppliers for even military hardware of this country that may not be available to us in, in time of war, let alone these other industrial capabilities. The, the public is now suddenly aware of this in the context of the dependence all of a sudden we realize we have on China for food and other products that are perhaps unsafe. That is a microcosm of a larger problem. Let me give you just one example directly relevant to your constituents. Uh, I was at the unveiling at the uh, Washington Auto Show of the GM Volt, mm -hmm. a very exciting concept car that they are very anxious to produce, they say. The reason given in response to Congressman Zinsley's question, why is it still five or ten years away, is they say they cannot get batteries for that car. Now, I am hopeful that the kinds of technologies that we are talking about here will help rectify that, but as long as we continue to rely on China, or Japan or Korea or somebody else to supply this stuff, we will always be at the mercy of guys who don't necessarily want the Volt to come on the market and be an effective competitor with their future products. And yet the uh, domestic auto industry, uh, actually the auto industry, is the only industry in America that has carbon constraints placed on it. We do not place carbon constraints on the oil and gas industry, on the electrical industry. Or what have you? I mean, apparently the Congress has made a conscious decision to do whatever they can to bankrupt the domestic auto industry. And do you think this is the best way for energy independence? I certainly do not. And I, more to the point, I think if that industry goes away, our dependence for other directly militarily relevant vehicles will also become a greater problem. So uh, this is not purely an, a lunatic economic approach. It is also, I think, a national security problem. Uh, I, I think that um, from what I have seen, the American auto companies right now are beginning to embrace the electrification of the vehicle, and the Chevy Volt is a great example of the technological change that can change this whole dynamic that you are talking about. Having a superior vehicle with superior technology with the advances. We had that uh, Chevy Volt at our facility yesterday, so all of our employees could, could drive it and take a look at it and experience it and uh, be motivated by what it means. Um, the, the key point right now is that we need, uh, we need to start something today and to demonstrate these capabilities. There are pockets of uh, reluctance and resistance around the industry and around the world saying a lot of this can't be done. I think the key thing is we need to do some things, and then the combination of the two is going to strengthen the automotive competitiveness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Mr. Cleaver for um, uh, yielding his time to me at the outset to make a call at 11.30. Uh, but as I mentioned in my opening statement, I drive flex fuel vehicles. I drive a Chevy Impala that can fill up with E85 
85% blend of ethanol, and I drive a Jeep Liberty common rail diesel that can fill up with biodiesel. And given what uh, Ms. Miller has been saying about uh, the importance of our domestic auto manufacturing capacity, I think uh, that Detroit has made a, a significant commitment uh, in trying to find a competitive edge in light of a number of factors that she identified and that flex fuel vehicle manufacturing uh, has been where they have been trying to find the niche in light of some of the difficulty of getting access to these batteries for their hybrid uh, manufacturing. So I don't want to in any way undercut but rather enhance what Detroit has already done and the direction that we hope to incent uh, as it relates to plug-in hybrid technology. But I, I'm wondering if any of you can address the issue of why we haven't seen any manufacturing of the flex fuel, flex fuel gas electric hybrids, let alone any flex fuel plug-in hybrids. Is it an infrastructure issue in the availability of fuels like E85, like biodiesel? Is it primarily the issue of the difficulty of getting the batteries uh, to be able to integrate both technologies into one vehicle? My understanding is that perhaps down at Virginia Tech, they have been doing some research. They have got a car that is a hybrid flex fuel vehicle, but are there any others on the road that you are aware of? And don't you agree that it makes sense, I think, Mr. Gaffney, you do in your testimony, that we should take the next sort of, well, add the small step of ensuring that we can have vehicle engines that can run on any combination of liquid fuel and electricity. But beyond that, we have to ensure that the liquid fuel is anything from pure gasoline to pure ethanol to biodiesel and anything in between. And perhaps you might want to comment as well on vehicle engines uh, as it relates to diesel fuel. We know that in Europe we have far more passenger vehicles that utilize the diesel engine technology. And your thoughts on, on what we can do in this area? May I respond? Um, one of the fuels that you mentioned, or failed to mention, I should say, is methanol. And I think the marginal additional cost in programming the chip to ensure that it can also consume methanol is, is negligible. So we ought to be making sure that that's a piece of the flexible fuel vehicle equation. But I, I, as I said in my testimony, I cannot imagine why we are not making it an obligation of any car manufacturer, not just Detroit, but any car manufacturer that wishes to sell cars in the United States, that they have to have seat belts for every passenger. That's a given. They have to have airbags for the front two passengers. That's a given. They ought to also have a flexible fuel vehicle capability built into the car. It just immediately, whether there are supply problems right now or whether there are localized areas where you can get this particular alternative fuel or another, over time the fleet is transformed into one that has a requirement for a fraction of the gasoline. Now, you may want to use gasoline for other reasons, but you don't have to if you've got these other features built into it. And my hope is you're absolutely right that what we will do is a result of this, what I call tsunami of legislation, is create incentives, create R&D programs, create demonstration programs, create education programs, but most especially facilitate production in this country so that you will have plug-in hybrid electric vehicles that have Yes, a flexible fuel vehicle capability as well. Uh, if I could offer a couple thoughts on that. It seems that, um, from our view, the plug-in hybrid is part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. And our attitude is that we need to sort of diversify the way we uh, fuel vehicles in order to have the purchasing ability for Americans to have a vehicle that fits their needs best. Right now, we do that basically by size. You pick a car uh, on your needs on that. What, what we need to do is to change the fueling infrastructure and change the, the engine technology so that cars can run on a multiplicity of fuels, and that way consumers can pick that type of vehicle that best fits their needs. For an urban consumer that does a, a daily commute, a plug-in hybrid might be best. In other areas, it may be a, a flex fuel vehicle that that has other capabilities. But I think that is how we sort of get away from this problem we have of, of overdependence on one fuel source. Well, I thank you for your responses. And I do, uh, does anyone want to address the diesel 
engine technology issue? I mean, uh, Mr. View, I, in terms of are, are there complications with uh, developing uh, or utilizing the battery technology with a diesel engine? No, no, not at all. I think the, the, um, uh, the proposition that we have today for uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles is, is a system that is in harmony with a flex fuel vehicle by the very nature of it, and it isn't. The, the electrification is a piece of the problem. I don't think anyone is suggesting uh, that uh, we are ready techni technologically to make fully electric vehicles. It's, a, it's a probably in the category of where we, we looked at uh, fuel cell vehicles a few years ago. There's a lot more time uh, to get to the point you have that. Um, uh, the Chevy Volt and I think the GM platform suggests that the, the proper combination for technology we have available today is a vehicle that runs on an electric motor with a series of batteries that power that. The batteries can be provided with energy from a number of flexible sources. One of those can be a generator that runs on uh, biofuels, diesels, and a number of different materials, and it can be plugged in as well from a local source. So having that combination of flexibility is, is really what the American people want. Uh, they want to have a vehicle that they can use extensively, they can use efficiently and with uh, less pollution. Thank you. And just one final comment, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with what Mr. Gaffney said in his response that any requirement, uh, any incentive, uh, but any, again, requirement that we will consider as it relates to flex fuel vehicles has to be on any car sold in the United States. It cannot be simply targeted Detroit, which has already made a significant commitment in this area. Um, and I think that, again, whether it is fuel choice, vehicle choice uh, is important. And then, of course, I appreciate what Austin is doing as it relates to the importance of smart grid metering, uh, because we have a lot of wind in South Dakota, just like you have a lot of wind in Texas. And I think that we have tremendous opportunity for storage capacity in electric vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Lowe, uh, Senator, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, uh, right now, I mean, it, there's not a lot of discussion about the fact that ethanol is subsidized at about 51 cents a gallon, uh, which is tremendous. Uh, there's a tremendous subsidy, $4.4 billion a year. What, kind, what do you think the Federal Government can do or should do uh, that would encourage uh, the, the uh, manufacturers and the public to move uh, si significantly toward uh, plug-in hybrids? Well, you, first of all, you have to understand is uh, I'm playing a presidential candidate, so I'm loath to get into ethanol because I'd like to win Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that said, I think part of what we're well, certainly my thrust here today is to raise awareness that we're even having this discussion, that for those who are still in the flat earth society that there's maybe not a problem with our environment, okay, let's take that off the table. Certainly you agree that this is a national security issue. So there are two wonderful reasons to be having this, this debate. And I think when the public tunes into this, I think that they'll be engaged. And as like I said in my testimony, I believe they do want to do their part. I have uh, one of my best friends has just recently converted his whole fleet to biodiesel. He loves it. Um, uh, I've been driving this uh, plug-in hybrid. Um, I've been able to drive some other prototypes. Uh, when uh, Governor Schwarzenegger was uh, sworn in, all of his official fleet at the swearing in were prototypes from all over the world, and they were extraordinary. So. I, I think in answer to your question, you have to lead the public into an area where they're ready to accept this and ready to take action. And on a parallel track, you need to be working with Detroit and also making sure that the other foreign manufacturers have the same uh, amount of impediments is not the right word. But, but what's, good, what's good for the goose needs to be good for the gander, I think. And, um, so I think it's, it's really a parallel track. I have a um, mobile office in Kansas City uh, where, incidentally, the Ford Motor Company has a plant there that produces uh, the escape hybrid. But my, uh, my mobile unit runs on vegetable oil, uh, which costs about 70 cents a gallon. 
Now, it is true that you sometimes smell like a Big Mac, but... <laughs> How's that for your diet? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, 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 when you, I, I agree with you, and I brought this up because I, I think that there probably should be a... I mean, we should use every available uh, source of reducing our dependence on foreign oil. And I think we make a terrible mistake if we think that we, we can solve this problem simply by getting more plug-in hybrids or uh, E85 or, uh, you know, any other flex fuel vehicles. There's a problem and that I'd like one of you, to, uh, someone to address. When we use flex fuels, the, the engines are not calibrated to operate optimally for any of them. Uh, and so it, it, the more we, we, we talk about flex fuels, we're also talking about not getting the car, putting cars on the road that are, that are operating uh, at their optimum. I, I, is, is that a concern that I should discard? Well, what is the object of the exercise? From, from my perspective, the object of the exercise is reducing the amount of oil that we rely upon to power our transportation fleet. If we have alternatives to oil that may be used less efficiently in some respects, but that are indigenously available, that, that we're getting